entire section devoted to, to John Berridge. It's also one of uh, William Gadsby's favorite uh, hymn writers. Uh, he, I'm not sure what he's a uh, uh, what you would call his denomination. I think uh, most would call him an Anglican uh, Church of England, uh, but I've seen him referred to otherwise as a Methodist also, but uh, probably uh, commonly referred to as an Anglican, but he believed in the, in, the, in the doctrines of grace, I think. You can tell by the way he penned his uh, sermons. And I like this one. He, he uses as a, uh, as a reference Hosea chapter 14, verse number 8, which I'll read at the end of my sermon. It says, What have I to do any more with idols? Now just think about Christianity in, in this time of year and the things that are going on and then think about that as we read, as we read this uh, hymn. It says, Our fancy loves to range in search of earthly good and freely would exchange a pearl for rotten wood. Snaps at a shadow, thin and vain, is fooled and vexed, yet snaps again. Fain would the heart unite a Christ with idols base and link midday with night or mammon foul with grace. And in one bosom false as hell would have the ark and Dagon dwell. Dagon's a reference to the, the, the Philistine god uh, who fell when uh, the ark was left overnight in the temple of Dagon uh, when the Philistines captured the ark and took it into, uh, into uh, Philistia. The two can't live together. It says in verse 3, But Christ will not allow a rival near his throne. A jealous God art thou, and wilt be king alone. Dagon shall fall before thy face. For thy sweet ark will leave the place. Dear Jesus, thou art true, though false from thee I slide, and wilt thou not subdue and link me to thy side? I would give all my ramblings o'er. Speak, Lord, and bid me stray no more. It's kind of a, a hymn that has to do, I think, with uh, mixing the service of Christ with the with, uh, service unto idols. That's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to use it in my text, Romans chapter number 14, verses 1 through 6. You can see the title of my sermon is Esteeming One Day Above Another. I usually like to take my titles from a phrase and a verse if I can, especially if I'm using, uh, a, uh, if I've got something uh, precise in mind that I want to preach from in a certain text. This was kind of hard to do, it was a challenge, but I thought, well, that, that's a fitting title, Esteeming One Day Above Another. You can determine as we go along whether it's good or evil. Romans chapter number 14, verse number 1 says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, Another he esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. There's a reference here, I think, to uh, uh, Jewish holy days. A lot of folks think that this is well, number one, in, in this passage, uh, people see Christian liberties on display. They think, well, uh, Christians are at liberty to serve God and worship God as they see fit. But, and that is true. But I'll caution you with this fact. It says at the beginning of the, of the chapter, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. There are some that are weak in the faith that serve God as they see fit, and they're entirely in error. Their conscience may not prick them. They may not even see their error because they're weak in the faith. And what Paul is saying here is that it's understood. Not all Christians are going to uh, ascend to the same level of understanding. Some will be weak in the faith, and it's our duty, those that have grown in the faith, to counsel them, to, to succor them, but never, I, I don't think, are we uh, supposed to indulge in, in what we see as sinful behavior that they might engage in. But they may not yet be pricked in their hearts or in their conscience because of the error of their ways. Uh, I, I, I was reading what one commentator had to say about some of these things. Oh, I forget who it was now. It might have been a biblical illustrator, but he definitely wasn't a Baptist. Because what he was saying was that, uh, you know, in Christian liberties, we need extremes in religion. We need, he even mentioned the Calvinists over here. And we need the Arminians over here. So that as a whole, in the universal church of God, this is how he applied it, we can see the extent of the religion uh, and, and the, the extent of the beliefs in Christianity. We can be exposed to it all. And he thought that was a good thing. 
And he was actually commending those that would teach Arminian on one side or those on the other extreme that would, would, would preach uh, Calvinism, what he called it, on the other end. You know, in, in, he, he thinks that in God's eyes, we, have, we are at liberty to serve him as we see fit. That's foolishness. There, there always is a right way to serve the Lord. There always is a right choice that we make. There isn't any gray area that dwells between right and wrong, and we can, and we can hedge over into that in, in, some, in some level, and we can still be properly serving the Lord. We may go into that gray area because of our own mistakes or because of our own lack of understanding, but it doesn't make it right in the sight of God. It was either right in the sight of God to observe these days that Paul's referring to, or it wasn't. It was either right to indulge in the uh, eating of this food, or it wasn't. God, God knows what's right and what's wrong, and it's our duty to seek to attain the understanding of His will so that we can properly serve Him here on the earth. We do have liberty, and, and one Christian can't tell another Christian precisely what he can or cannot do. I think as uh, members of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are under the authority of the church. But, the, but the, the Christians, as they serve, are at liberty to serve. They have that Christian liberty. They have that liberty to serve the Lord as they see fit. And I suppose the church may even have to, at some point, uh, discipline those members if they stray too far. But they have that liberty. They have that own personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which none can interfere with and none can take away. But a lot of folks think, well, this is a, a license for men to observe uh, days as they see fit. But really, uh, there, there's no reference here to pagan day, paganism. Uh, we know right, right away when Paul says, uh, uh, he says, one believeth uh, that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. I think this is a reference to Judaism, to the, to the Jewish uh, history and tradition out of which many of these Christians were called. And in the beginning of Christianity, Judaism was the, uh, was the root out of which it was drawn. And a lot of those traditions, those days, those, the, the diet, the things they ate, were drawn from that. And so many Jews that had become Christians would impose their own traditions that they had, which were foreign to the Gentiles. They would impose those, that diet and those uh, traditions and those days upon the Gentiles. Paul's saying that there's liberty here. There's never a question of indulging in pagan holidays. That would not have been tolerated at all. So you can't use this passage when it says in verse number 5, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He's talking about Jewish Christians as opposed to Gentile Christians. He is not talking about Jewish or Gentile Christians indulging in pagan holidays and pagan high days or holy days. That would not have been tolerated at all. That was plainly and clearly wrong. But for the Jews that wanted to continue the traditions of their fathers, Paul says you're free to do so as you see fit. He himself knew that. He himself knew that none of these things held, held him in bondage and he wasn't obliged to observe these anymore. Although in certain company he may, he may conform to their uh, habits. There wasn't, he, to him it, was, it, was, it was not, wasn't any uh, reason to continue in it. To the Gentiles, if they were if they were inclined to indulge in the, in the Jewish traditions and the Jewish days, well, uh, you have that liberty. But it's not something that would have to be uh, conformed to, because like we said at the beginning of the passage, Paul admits that there are some that are weak in the faith. We're going to give answer to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have liberty to serve Him. And if we abuse those liberties, or we are not educated or informed, we may indulge in things that may offend even our God. You can draw some parallels here. Uh, I want to establish, first of all, that you can't use this passage to, as, a, as a means to say, well, you can observe Christmas or not, and it's up to you. Uh, you have that liberty. You, 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 that's not what it's intended to, uh, to teach. This is concerning Jewish holidays and holy days. But I suppose you can draw some parallels if you have a newly saved Christian that is, is saved by the grace of God, and he begins to serve the Lord, and he sees these, uh, these uh, holidays which are Christian they think, and which, have, and, and which are observed by other Christian denominations. And, it, and, and in some ways, that, there is a parallel there to those that are saved uh, amongst the Gentiles that were brought into a, a Christianity that was largely influenced by Judaism. Now, now today, folks are saved and are brought into a Christianity that's largely influenced by Catholicism. And so maybe some of these Catholic days, or these pagan days, may, they may wonder whether or not they should observe these. And some may be confused. They might be misled. They might indulge in some holy days that have some, some religious roots, but they're mostly secular and pagan. 
But some people, like I said, they'll use this passage just as a, as a license to participate in any worldly holiday that they would like to, but that's not what it's intended to, to do. And it, it definitely isn't what it proves. There aren't any days that have any holiness attached to them. There shouldn't be any special regard given to any, any so-called holy day in a spiritual sense. The first day of the week, Sunday, it is the Lord's day. And we know it's the Lord's day because he arose on that day. And we have this pattern of gathering together as churches of Jesus Christ, which is established in the New Testament. We have precedent for that. In the scriptures, we have precedent for the saints of God and the churches of Jesus Christ gathering together on the first day of the week. We do not have precedent in, in the New Testament, uh, in the Holy Scriptures, of the, of the saints of God gathering together for any other holy day that you might imagine. There isn't any day that's holy in and of itself. What sanctity is attached to Sunday, it comes from Jesus Christ and from the, the person and the work and the accomplishments of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Other than the fact that we're expected to gather together with the churches of Jesus Christ and we're expected to commemorate the Lord's Day by our presence in the house of God, we have to admit that in the sight of God, every other day ought to be esteemed equal. Every other day ought to be esteemed equal. But yet the world has this habit of esteeming one day above another. In the, in the scriptures we find out that days are days, weeks are weeks, months are months, years are years. We ought not place any higher value or any religious significance on any day, season, month, or year other than the fact that we should redeem the time, the days that the Lord gives to us, and use every day that the Lord grants to us to serve Him and give Him the glory and the praise that's due His name. That should be every day. That should be every day alike. There, I'm going to lift this verse out of context. The psalmist says in Psalm 118, verse 24, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I used to quote that to myself a lot of times when I got up. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I think there are some implications here of salvation. That the Lord has ordained a day in which we shall be saved. And a day in which the Lord Jesus Christ will accomplish uh, the, what's necessary in order for men to be saved. And the psalmist perhaps is looking forward to that. John Gill thinks that this day could even be the gospel age. This is the day which the Lord hath made, who we will rejoice and be glad in. But I think, you know, this is the day of the, of the gospel being spread to the whole the world. But I think you could apply it literally to each and every day that you get out of bed. You could apply this to yourself. This is the day which the Lord hath made. He made it. It's, it's, it. I'm not esteeming this day above any other. This is the day that he made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We don't need any outside motivation to elevate the importance of any particular day. We will serve the Lord. We will rejoice and be glad Every day. I'm going to move through these points quickly since my introduction was so long. But the first thing I want us to think about are the holy days that men have set up. You, you, can, you can get this if you say holy day kind of fast. You'll, you'll figure out pretty soon that that's holiday. That's holiday. That's where it comes from. It's a holy day originally, although many of the holidays we now observe uh, as state holidays or, or national holidays, many of these are, don't have any uh, holy uh, beginnings or any reference to, to uh, religion at all, it still has become a habit. Holy days, holidays, days that are set apart, esteemed higher than others. Religions and societies have a tendency to establish holy days. They have a, they observe good, good days and bad days. Some days will have positive implications. Some will be set apart because they have, there are negative implications associated with those particular days. And that's outside of the fact that there are typically secular days that are observed on civil calendars. You have days that commemorate some, uh, some event. You have days in nations and states that, that, that have civil or historical implications, and those are set up as uh, holidays. You have days that are associated with important times or, or seasons in the, in the lunar cycle or, the, or the, almost, uh, you know, uh, in regards to the sun, you know, times of the year or times of the month. These, some of these are days are set apart and esteemed higher than others. But none of these days, not a single one of them, is holy or good in and of itself. None of the established, sanctified, or instituted days have any meritorious value. They don't have any redeeming qualities in them, even if they are given some religious significance. And yet men and women will approach certain days with a religious fervor and zeal, which you hardly ever see applied to the Lord's day itself. The things that, that folks do in Christianity around Christmas, they, they could be doing every Sunday if they, wanted, if they want to see it as a religious uh, in, uh, uh, endeavor. 
Oh, Michelle said one of the preachers said that the angels sang at the, at the, at the uh, birth of Jesus Christ and they rejoiced and I'm going to do it too. Well, why not do that every Sunday? Why not do that every day of the year? You have opportunity to. The Lord gives you the breath of life. Why not, why not sing praises to the Lord every day of the year? But men will attach special fervor and zeal to these worldly holidays that uh, have some sort of religious significance. I wish we could see that fervor and that zeal applied to the Lord's day and the worship in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Over in Galatians chapter number 4, verse number 8, Galatians chapter 4, verse number 8. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. This is a habit we all have. We served by nature those that aren't, aren't gods. Ourself, you know, uh, our desires, our, our pleasures. We might have listened to somebody else, you know. But we worshiped and did service unto those which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, as Paul says, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements Whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Now again, maybe you could think about the Jews and the Jewish Christians that were attaching too much significance to circumcision or attaching too much uh, significance to the, the Passover or the other, uh, you know, the other holy days, Pentecost or whatever. And Paul's afraid of them. Unless he had bestowed upon them labor and base. You see, there isn't uh, a, again, Christian liberty may lead some folks to indulge in these things, but as they indulge in their Christian liberty, it doesn't make it right. And Paul is even afraid of some of the things that he can see them doing. He's afraid of you, lest I bestow. The possibility existed in the mind of the Apostle Paul that he had bestowed labor upon some of these Galatians in vain. And perhaps their salvation wasn't genuine. Perhaps the labor that he bestowed upon them, even to teach them after they were saved, maybe all of that was in vain, and Satan still yet held hold over. That was Paul's fear, I think. Let me read you a quote from Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon said, Among the heathen there were diverse lucky and unlucky days, sacred days, and days in which they indulged in sensual excess. They had even holy months and unholy months. Now all that kind of thing is done away with in the case of a Christian. He is set free from such weak and beggarly superstitions. <laughs> Among the Jews, there were certain sacred festivals, times that were more notable than other seasons. But they also were done away with in Christ. Now think about it. All the festivals, all the feasts, all the high days, all the holy days that the Jews had, that's fulfilled in Christ. Those all pointed forward to Christ. Why would you still yet need to indulge in them when the, 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 Passover, lamb, uh, the, the lamb that the Passover lamb pictured has already died on the cross? You know, why would you need to indulge in these, in, in these sacrifices and these rites when all that they pictured, Jesus Christ, has already been accomplished? This is what Spurgeon says. We observe the Christian Sabbath. But beyond that, to the true believer, there should be no special observance of days and months and years. All that is a return to the weak and beggarly elements from which Christ has delivered him. That bondage is all ended now. But there are some who still observe days and months and times and years. And Paul says to them, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Then Spurgeon says, every day is holy. Every year is holy to a holy man. And every place is holy too to the man who brings a holy heart into it. There isn't any day that, you, that, that when that day dawns, you're going to become more holy. And somehow because that's a sanctified and set apart holy day, it's going to inspire in you greater, uh, a greater desire to serve the Lord. If you don't have that holy desire in your heart, there isn't anything that a so-called holy day can do for you. These are all silly superstitions that war against the truth. And they fight against the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And these holy days are just crutches that men use to try to make themselves perhaps more holy, imagining there's some value or some holiness in that day itself. Holy days and feasts and festivals, they only diminish the importance of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 16. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Well, people say, here's Christian liberty again. Do what you want to. Man can't judge you. He says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Actually, what Paul's warning about here is the opposite. Don't indulge in such things by which other men will see you 
and then assume that you participate and that you partake of them. Again, you have Christian liberty. You can, you can partake of any food you want. And, and you know that God is the one that made the food, not some false god. You could even go uh, conceivably to an idolatrous feast, which he's going to refer to here, and partake of the food. It's not going to, it's not going to break you down because you know that it's not that, that, that that's food that God made, but you're a poor witness to the others. And, you, and by your presence and by your participation, you make it seem to others that these things are right and proper in the sight of God. Paul says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things that he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. I wonder how many folks worship angels at this time of year as they think about the, the uh, Christmas season. And not holding a head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment, ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if he be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men. Why are we now subject to ordinances that come because of the commandments and doctrines of men, which are not found in the Scriptures? Which things, Paul says, have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Well, the, the Muslims have Ramadan where they, where they uh, fast for, what, a, a whole month? I don't know how long it is. They won't eat any time during the daylight hours. And that, that does show a good uh, will and a good, and a good desire and, a, and good willpower, you might say. But how does it please God? How does it praise God? And we may indulge in some other, uh, you know, even so-called Christian function, which may, uh, may we, you know, it may, uh, our participation in it, uh, we think might somehow uh, make us appear more Christian to the world. But how does it please God? How, how does it give praise to the Lord Jesus Christ by participating in something that we know has only pagan origins? Is any day better than any other day in the sense that we can experience more of God? Or in the sense that we can be more spiritual just because this is a holy day that's proclaimed by men? Why would you observe traditions and feasts and days which will not be carried over into eternity? In which, in which heaven will have no knowledge of? There's not going to be any Christmas celebrations in heaven. So why would we indulge in them here on the earth? Easter is something else that would be foreign to heaven and not allowed. You know, and, and historically, uh, if you look at this, uh, Easter is something that, that the Catholics indulged in before Christmas. And that, that came along first, and Christmas, Christmas came along sometime later. What did all the churches do before Christmas was, uh, became a, a, a regular occasion in the Catholic Church? They must have survived for those several hundred years without any knowledge of any such thing as a, as a birthday celebration for Jesus Christ. And somehow they served the Lord. I think the institution of these holy days by the decree of societies or religions is only meant to attract the attention of their followers, to give them some reasons to indulge in the occasions which they promote, to give them some, something tangible that they can grab onto. There never was any spiritual value in these holy days. There never was any saving purpose in these holy days. Even in the case of the Jewish holy days in the Old Testament, they were only a reminder of the relationship that, that these folks had with God. And their observance of the law of Moses only proved that they were, they were followers of God. In the case of the unsaved, you know, to observe the sacrifices and, and, and to go to Passover and all the holy days, it didn't do him one ounce of good if he wasn't saved. And in the case of the saved, it didn't save him. It was only a picture of that salvation which was to come. And they knew that. They knew that, that this was a picture of their Messiah and their salvation to come. A true man of God would be serving God every day in those days. King David knew that he could serve the Lord no matter where he was. <coughs> God commanded the Jews to observe those days, they, therefore they ought to perform their duties. But in the New Testament, the time of the Jewish Sabbaths and holy days is over, and in their place, no new days have been given to us. No new holy days have been given to us. No, no new uh, days that, that, that commemorate or picture the, the person and the work of Jesus Christ uh, you know, as something that is coming. All that we have is this, uh, well, the only ordinances that we have are baptism and the Lord's Supper. And we have this decree that we should worship the Lord on the Lord's Day publicly assembling together. That's it. No other signs, no other holy days are assigned to us that we might observe. Anything else that's introduced into Christianity must have come after the time of Christ, and it's foreign to true worship of Jesus Christ. That's far worse than what the Apostle Paul 
uh, spoke to the Galatians and the Romans about. That's far, far worse than indulging in traditional Jewish days because you're a Jew, and yet you're a, a Christian Jew, but you still want to indulge in these cultural or traditional things. What men and women are doing today is far worse because the roots of these holy days don't, don't have any Jewish origins or Old Testament origins. They only have pagan and ungodly origins. Brother Wetzel read in Luke uh, a couple of times. I've got several verses in Luke also. Luke chapter 16, verse number 13. It says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. You cannot serve God and man. It's pretty similar to what John Berry said in our hymn. He said, Fain would the heart unite a Christ with idols face. I mean, that's pretty much what people are doing today. They're, they're uniting Christ with idols, base idols of men. And you can't do that and properly serve the Lord. So, the observance of holy days leads to, uh, and, and it's even a product of idolatry, which is what I want to talk about next. But the more that you engage in holy days, the more that you're, the, the, the more that you're promoting idolatry. The danger of holy days and the introduction of worldly ordinances is that these things will progress into blatant idolatry. Most of the time, we think of idolatry as an Old Testament word. We think of it as an Old Testament issue, a problem at the at the you know, or at the most, a problem that has to be dealt with by by primitive or heathen societies. We think about these folks as being the idol worshippers. We think about idolatry as being something that the uninformed and the uh, uh, you know and the heathen might indulge in, and maybe we might even consign it just to an Old Testament uh, idea. But idolatry is an attitude. Idolatry is a heinous sin, which is found and it's rampant in each and every generation of men. In reality, idolatry exists wherever men and women are engaged in a worship of anything or anyone other than the Lord God. He's the one that made us. We owe Him our devotion. Saved or unsaved, uh, you know, elect or reprobate, men owe their devotion and their obedience unto God. Whether they'll recognize it or not, God made us. We owe him our obedience and our worship. Idolatry is when men do not give him that worship, when they do not give him that obedience. I looked it up in the Merriam-Webster uh, online dictionary, and this is the definition that they give for idolatry. It's the worship of a physical object as a god, or it's immoderate attachment or devotion to something. <laughs> That, that's a pretty good definition, I think. The worship of a physical object as a god. In other words, we're worshiping something physical rather than God. Or it's an immoderate attachment or devotion to something. An extreme attachment or devotion to something. That's idolatry. Much of Christianity is currently engaged this time of year in open idolatry. Let me read to you the first two commandments in Exodus chapter 20. One of these days we'll get back to this series. But in Exodus chapter 20, it says in verse 1, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Again, not only did he make us, but he also brought these out. So he's going to have a special relationship with these. But based on that, what he's done for them, he has this right to say, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Number two, he says in verse four, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Uh, I think uh, Christianity, as it's engaged in idolatry this time of year, uh, are, they're, are they are encouraging folks to break these first two commandments to have another God before the true God uh, and they they are making these graven images they have all these uh, all this idol worship going on today we ought not try to justify our idolatry in the sight of God he's not deceived he's not pleased with the blatant idolatry that's observable in Christmas he, he, he's not happy with it there's no way to justify our indulgence in it I'll get you a quote from uh, John Calvin also. It says, When certain days are represented as holy in themselves, when one day is distinguished from another on religious grounds, when holy days are reckoned a part of divine worship, then days are improperly observed. In other words, if your worship is based upon a, a, an observance of a holy day, that's an improper worship. That's an improper observation of that day. 
We've already pointed out that none of these days in and of themselves can be proclaimed holy. When holy days are reckoned a part of divine worship, which is what people are doing today, then days are improperly observed. I'm going to give you a little bit of history on the idolatry of Christmas, and I'll move through this quickly too. The date for Christmas was chosen by the Catholics. We know this. It's based, based upon the already existing heathen worship of false gods. In the northern hemisphere, this is the, the winter solstice. Uh, sometimes they call it the December solstice, but, but because Catholicism stretches across the globe now. But in the, in the beginning, in, in, the, in the Middle Ages in, in Europe, in northern Africa, you're in the northern hemisphere. And so the winter solstice is uh, December. And it's at this time of year that you already had existing heathen celebrations. They just wanted to incorporate that into their, uh, into, into their Catholicism. They just wanted to attract these folks into their worship and, and get, make them a part of their universal, visible Catholic church. Look over in Psalm 115. Psalm 115, verse number 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. <laughs> Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. So you can do your best at making an idol. You can have all of these features. Eyes and ears and nose and throat and mouth. Feet and hands. But that idol can't use any of them. It's an immovable, uh, non-functioning uh, idol. And yet men will worship them. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Yet the Catholics use this weakness of men to worship idols to, to uh, uh, draw them into their ranks. Uh, all the while uh, spewing their, uh, their, uh, you know, their idolatry. They thought that they could bring them in without removing from them first the taint of idolatry. Idol worship has always been an issue. It's always been a prevalent sin amongst men. I looked it up on history.com uh, concerning Christmas. It says, The middle of winter has long been a time of celebration around the world. Centuries before the arrival of the man called Jesus, history.com probably doesn't even believe that Jesus is more than a man, but centuries before the arrival of the man called Jesus, early Europeans celebrated light and birth in the darkest days of winter. Many peoples rejoiced during the winter solstice when the worst of the winter was behind them and they could look forward to longer days and extended hours of sunlight. Now we know, living in the northern hemisphere, that after December 21st, we really have the bulk of our winter ahead of us, but the days are now getting longer. And that's something to look forward to, and the days are now getting longer. The shortest day has come and passed. Days are now getting longer, and spring will soon uh, be a result of those days getting longer. Long before the concept or the establishment of Christmas at the end of December, you had in, uh, in Europe, you had the Scandinavians had their Yule Log. Uh, the Germans uh, worshipped their false god Odin at this time of year. The Romans had a day set up to worship Saturn. You know, they didn't have real extreme summers or winters there in uh, uh, Italy and thereabouts. But they had this, uh, they had this god called uh, Saturn who was the god of agriculture. They worshipped him at this time of year. And they worshipped the, the god named Mithra, who is the god of the sun, at this same time of year. Normally, the worship that they gave at these, this time of year was based on feasts. They'd have liquor, they'd have feasting, they'd have boisterous merrymaking. And like uh, Charles Spurgeon referred to, they, they even had sensual uh, you know, uh, celebrations. And yet, when looking for a day to uh, celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ... Pope Julius I couldn't find any date in the scriptures, right? Because it's not there. But in looking for a day to uh, celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, he chose December 25th. Probably because this day coincided with the many pagan feasts that were already being held at that time of year. Back where Brother Jerry read to us in Jeremiah chapter number 10. This is what the pagans are all about. Jeremiah chapter number 10. Verse number one, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. See, the heathen already had these worship because they observed this, the signs of the heavens. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands, 
of the workmen with the axe. Uh, Scandinavians had that Yule log that they would cut that down, they would set it on fire, and they said uh, it might burn as many as a dozen days. But they counted the sparks going up from that Yule log, and they thought every spark would be a new pig born, or a new cow born in the coming spring. And, they, and they, so they wanted that log to burn as long as it could. And so they had their celebration centered around you know, this, uh, this time of the year because they know the days are now getting longer and they're going to look forward to spring. You had the Germans that were afraid to go out of their house because of, of their god Odin that they thought went all the way around the world looking at, at who was doing good and who was doing evil at this time of year. And they didn't want him to see him because they probably were not uh, you know, always proud of the way that they lived. And the Romans just worship the Mithra, the god of the sun, because now the days are getting longer. More and more of the sun's going to be seen. And the custom of the people is, is, is like this. They, they, they cut down this tree, and here you can see even a picture of the Christmas tree. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fast it with nails and with hammers that it moves not. And it could represent any other idol that they might make. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. This is just like uh, we read in Psalm 115. Uh, they must needs be born because they cannot go, because if they have legs, they don't work. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. You know, these, these false idols don't have any power over us. Why would we, why would we, you know, why would we be afraid of them? There, it isn't in them to do good or evil. Our God can do both. Not that He can do the evil, but He can permit it to come upon us. And He can judge us. And He definitely can intervene and do good. He's a God that's worthy of praise and worship and service. Because he can do good. And he can permit evil to come upon us. He can protect us. He can take care of us. We ought to be afraid of him. We ought to serve him. So you have, you, you know, you, so you have all this heathen worship that's incorporated now into the Catholicism. But heathen ways cannot become heavenly ways. This was known even in the, at the time, you know, a few centuries after Jesus Christ when they started instituting uh, uh, the, the, the time of Christmas. And what it was was the Christ Mass. That went, I think, on the history.com, I think it said it went first into Egypt, and by the 6th century it was in England. But uh, our Baptist forefathers didn't indulge. They've always resisted the observance of such pagan and Catholic holy days. If you, if you keep going down into uh, history, you'll find out that the Puritans didn't take part in it. William the Conqueror, when he took over in uh, England, he banned Christmas in England as a, as a Puritan. And it didn't come back until... Uh, Josh could tell you, but I think it's Charles the First or Charles the Second took over for for William the Conqueror, and then by uh, by a popular opinion, they forced him to reinstitute Christmas. Christmas wasn't a holy day in early America. In fact, if you, in in or in uh, uh, Boston from 1659 to 1681, it was illegal to have any observance of Christmas. You couldn't have a tree, a Yule log, or anything of that nature. It was illegal. Now, you could, I mean, again, you've got Christian liberty. You can indulge in it, I suppose, and you might get away with it, but you couldn't publicly pronounce it in Boston. The debauchery and the heathenism of the celebration kept most devout Christians from an observance of it in America. But in the 1800s, it began to gain favor. And in 1870, Christmas began, became a federal holiday. You realize it wasn't a federal holiday before 1870. By 1870, in our nation, idolatry was now institutionalized. The idolatry had become a part of the calendar of Americans. Now, again, you can read up on it, and you'll see that, that Christmas became more of a unique American experience because we, we sought to eliminate some of the, uh, as a conservative uh, nation with a, uh, with a desire for the most part to please God, at least in the, on the public level, uh, they uh, omitted a lot of the debauchery and heathenism, but you can't take it and make it into something that's uh, pleasing unto God. And Baptists have historically deferred to participate in this pagan and Catholic Holy Day or Mass. It, had, it didn't become common amongst Baptists for sure until the 20th century. And there's still some out there, like us, who will withhold from an observance in this pagan and Catholic uh, Holy Day. It's a, it's a Catholic Mass that has been uh, propagated upon the world of Christianity. So you have man-made holy days that lead to idolatry. Uh, I'm just going to uh, finish up by talking about this worldly compromise. There's a worldly compromise now amongst the, the uh, true Christians because they think somehow that they can compromise with the idolatry of Christmas and still yet uh, seek to serve the Lord. Those who serve the Lord have always been attacked and beset by the wiles of the devil, by the distractions of the flesh. 
Satan's greatest successes historically have not been when he violently and openly and physically assaulted the people of God, but rather his greatest successes are when he manipulates, coerces, and uses worldly influences to shape the opinions and the practices of those that claim to be the children of God, and this even affects the churches of Jesus Christ. He uses worldly opinion to shape our opinions and practices. Christmas is an example of his success, one of his successes. As human beings, as fleshly creatures, uh, being absorbed in the things of this world, we sometimes look for spiritual or religious reasons to, to participate in events or happenings which cater only to the flesh. We'll look for reasons to excuse our participation in such uh, occasions. Again, over in Luke chapter number 16, we read verse 13. It says in Luke 16, verse 13, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. But if you read on, it says, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The, Pharisee were, the Pharisees were amongst those that sought to justify themselves before men, giving other reasons for their participation in uh, Jewish traditions. We might say today that Christians might be that, that same way, giving other reasons for participation in, in pagan holidays or, or blatant idolatry. We try to justify ourselves before men, but God knows our hearts. And it is a given fact, it is a, it is a scriptural fact, that that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. There is no spiritual value in Christmas. There is no glory that we can give to God by participating in an event which is wholly given over to idolatry and wholly an invention of pagans. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? I mean, what, what, is, what characteristic does Jesus the Christ share with uh, the God Saturn or the God Mithra? What, what does he have to do with a Yule log or with a, you know, the German God Odin? You know, it, 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 there isn't any shared characteristic. There aren't any shared values. And we ought not couple the two. He says, what agreement had the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Every day of the year were his people, not just on Christmas. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I just want to think about this sermon. I mean, there's some things that I was thinking about. You go down the road, you'll see a nativity scene. In the same yard, you'll see Santa Claus or Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. You can't mix the two. Besides the fact that the nativity scene is nothing but an idol, but then you can, you can pretend that's got some kind of uh, uh, some religious uh, significance, but right next to it, you've got Santa Claus. And that's not far from you know, a reference to Satan. Right there, you're linking Christ and Belial. Right there in your front yard. And then, and then at home you might have the program from the Christmas play, and then right next to it you'll have the latest flyer from Walmart with uh, you know, the, the cheapest prices on any kind of goods that you want to buy this time of year. You've got this, uh, this pretense at religious, uh, religion right here, right next to a desire for, for fleshly uh, pleasures. And then you'll go to the store and you'll hear on the, uh, you'll hear on the, uh, the PA speaker or the, you'll hear them playing music, they'll, you may, well, probably not in the store. Maybe, maybe you'll hear a Christmas carol, and they'll sing Joy to the World, which I kind of like that song. And that, that's actually a song that's, that is uh, uh, focused on the second return of Jesus Christ, not the first coming. It's an Isaac Watts song that I think speaks of the millennial reign. And people will sing that this time of year, but then in the next breath, they're going to sing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. You know, how can you, how can you link the two? There, there, isn't any, there isn't any way to glorify the Lord in, such, in, in that kind of type of context. Paul knew, if you get back to our text passage, Paul knew that he had liberty to worship the Lord. And his conscience, being edified and informed in the word and the will of God, wasn't bound to earthly ordinances and earthly holy days. Nor did Judaism any longer govern his worship of God. And yet he wouldn't indulge in things 
or words that would be misconstrued by things by those that would hear or behold him. He wouldn't indulge in those. Uh, he knew that, that he, he was he was free, and he wasn't bound by these Judy uh, these uh, uh, traditions of the Jews. But when he's amongst the Jews, he may he may participate in them because he is a Jew, and that's all it is. It's not it's not idolatry. It's just his heritage and his and his traditions. But he would stay far from it if it would offend the Gentiles. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 23, I think the same thing is true for, for us. We can say all we want to that the idols of Christmas have no power over us. There isn't any power in them to do either good or evil. But when we indulge in it or participate in it or, act, or outwardly condone it, we make it seem as if it's something that, we're, uh, that we uh, participate in and something that we do uh, condone, something that we hope prospers. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. Now I think this is a feast of, of, uh, uh, of family or friends, a social affair you might say. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. Now he knows that this meat won't harm him. But if a man says, I give you, I'm giving you this food, and, and we're giving thanks unto some idol uh, God for it, and, I, and, I, and we're presenting this as an offering to our idol or our God, Paul says, you know, don't partake of it. Uh, because you're, you're, you're actively uh, uh, participating in their, in their idol worship. He says, Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. This is something to consider. Our behavior is visible to others, and our participation in, in uh, uh, idolatrous things may uh, cause others to think that we condone it, even though we may try to dress it up in our own minds and say, well, I live under grace, and so these things can't affect me. It says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. If your conscience is convinced that you can glorify Christ and the Father by participating in Christmas, then you can do so. But I can tell you right now that according to the Scriptures and according to the beliefs and practices of our forefathers, you would be in the wrong. You could do it. You have Christian liberty, but you would be in the wrong. You may not even know it. The only reason your conscience wouldn't be offended is because you haven't studied and you haven't grown in the Lord like you should. That's, that's one thing that you can learn from the uh, idea of Christian liberty in the writings of the Apostle Paul. So in closing, I know I've taken a little longer than normal, we are, and I, but I think a sermon like this is necessary, if nothing else, for, for my children and my family. I pray that God would give us strength to cast away the idols that are attract our attention. The songs that we hear sung this time of year are kind of catchy, and they kind of inspire you to a little bit of uh, 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 you know, human joy, you might say. Earthly, it attracts the flesh. I pray God would give us the strength to cast away the idols that attract our attentions. I pray God would give us the wisdom and the boldness to turn to Him. Somebody has to stand up against Christmas. Somebody has to declare it to be a, a nothing but a pagan uh, and, a, and a Catholic holiday. And who's going to do it if the, if the Baptists don't? We need boldness to do that. To proclaim Him and His qualities as the basis for our salvation, not the works of men. Not the holy days that men devise. Not human renderings of a babe in a manger. Or, or the Catholic picture of a pleading Christ on a cross. That's not, that those are idols. And we don't indulge in them. We need to flee from idolatry. Flee from worldly compromise. Our salvation and our only hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we trust in Him, He'll be gracious to us. He'll give us the strength that we need. He'll use us in His service. And He'll give us the pleasures and the joys associated with the knowledge and presence of Jesus Christ. We would rather have those than the pleasures and the joys that we might gain in an association with Christmas or with idolatry. Let me read you this in closing. Hosea chapter 14. Hosea chapter 14. And I'm going to read to you 
Well, the whole chapter, verses 1 through 9. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words, and turn to the Lord, saying to him, Take away all iniquity, and receive us graciously, so will we render the calves of our lips. Asher shall not save us, we will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, Ye are our gods, for in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. I will, hear, I will heal their backsliding, I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. I like that. Think about the Lord healing our backsliding and loving us freely. I will be as a dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree and his smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, What have I to do anymore with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree, from me is thy fruit found. Who is wise, and he shall understand these things? Prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. I'll stop right there. Brother Jerry, would you?